Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Madeline Fortier, and I am the student president of the Buckley program. Thank you all for coming. Before I introduce our guests for today's debate, I'd like to say a few quick words about the program. The Buckley program is dedicated to the promotion of intellectual diversity on Yale's campus. We host lectures, debates, and conferences with guests who hold views that diverge from campus orthodoxy and challenge Yale students on their principles. To freshmen, upperclassmen, and grad students who are not yet involved in the Buckley program but would like to learn more, I highly recommend that you visit buckleyprogram.com to learn more about becoming a Buckley Fellow. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our guests. Rosalind Layton is a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Dr. Layton holds a PhD in business economics from Alberg University, and she served on President Trump's transition team for the Federal Communications Commission. Dr. Layton now researches and writes on telecommunications, mobile wireless, financial technology, and other related issues in Washington, D.C. Mitch Stoltz is a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Mr. Stoltz holds a JD from Boston University and currently works on cases at the EFF, where free speech and innovation intersect with copyright and trademark laws. He was previously the chief security engineer at the Mozilla Pro Project of Netscape Communications, later known as AOL, where he worked to secure web browsers and protect against hackers. Today, Dr. Layton and Mr. Stoltz will debate internet policy, whose rules should shape the internet. For background, net neutrality was President Obama's plan to regulate internet service providers. In December of 2017, the Trump FCC voted to repeal these net neutrality rules, citing a desire to promote competition on the web. Speaking in favor of the repeal, Dr. Layton will argue against the 2015 Obama-era rules. On the other side, Mr. Stoltz will present the Obama FCC's case for regulating the internet. The Buckley program is honored to be hosting both of these speakers this afternoon. Let's give a warm welcome to Rosalind Layton and Mitch Stoltz. So uh, thank you so much for the uh, uh, invitation today. I appreciate the, the uh, invitation from the Buckley program. It's, I've never been to Yale. It's just a beautiful place. It looks like a movie, a movie set. Um, but I want to thank all of you for coming on a Friday afternoon. It's very encouraging to see all the people interested in this issue. And, and indeed, I, I'm sure Mitch and I will see our passion about, about this <laughs> issue. So today I want to talk about this question of internet regulation by looking at the American Revolution. And if you compared the two armies, the American army and the British army, if you'd compared them on paper, there's no way that you'd think that the Americans would have won. They had very few soldiers, they had no weapons, they had no navy, the soldiers weren't even paid most of the time. But Washington persevered and won for the simple reason of innovation. He didn't try to fight the British with weapons. He fought them with intelligence military intelligence. Now here is where a Yale student who graduated in 1773 comes into the story. At the age of 22, Benjamin Talmadge was a, was a captain in the American army. He organized a group of his childhood friends between Connecticut, Long Island, and New York to develop a spy ring. And together they collected the vital intelligence to help Washington win the war. Now, Talmadge was also very concerned about military intelligence and its gathering because the British captured and executed his best friend and Yale classmate, Nathan Hale. So after the war, Talmadge went on to Congress. He served for the state of Connecticut. He was a noted Federalist. And he was an advocate for the freedom of speech and the protection of private property, the two things protected in our First and Fifth Amendment rights. So when we talk today about internet freedom and net neutrality, these are exactly the things that we're talking about from our Constitution. So when you study how the British had censored the American press during the, rev during the colonial era, you'll appreciate why our First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law to abridge the freedom of speech. And what does that mean in the Internet age? Well, it means the government can't impose its values on the Internet. However good it may seem, however much we like the idea of net neutrality, the government can't impose it. It can't impose whatever in, in value it has because it's not the role of government to tell a private provider whether they can block traffic, whether they can't. It's just not their domain. Now I'm going to tell you why this matters. 
there is an, an engineer by the name of Dan Berninger. He's the co-inventor of voice over internet protocol, VoIP, the technology we use in Skype. Now, he created a platform to bring high-definition voice to social media so that you could hear and speak your comments rather than writing or reading them. He created a platform called Hello Digital, and it required prioritization in order to work. That is, he had to get a, a, per, get a quality of service within the network to ensure that the, the packets were delivered in real time. This is the same thing we do when we go and purchase a package through, federal, through FedEx. But the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, they struck down this service, banned it completely, and Dan, Dan's platform was shut down. His users were not allowed to speak. And today, he has a First Amendment claim against the FCC sitting in Supreme Court. Now, Dan is no stranger to FCC overreach. Back in the 90s, he had to fight to ensure that voice over IP was not regulated like the rotary telephone. Now, I see that we have some different ages here, but those of the Yale students, this was before you were born. But for 50 years, we were under what was called uh, the Ma Bell Monopoly. And the FCC was in a collusion with a government-sanctioned monopoly through Title II of the Communications Act. It, this forced consumers to pay extra high r rates for long distance, and it restricted their ability to purchase a telephone independently. It was so bad that the Department of Justice had to break this monopoly up and this collusion with the federal regulators. Now, you would think we had learned our lesson from this terrible experiment, but regulatory advocates want to take the same statutes and put them on the internet. This will allow them to set its price, to mandate technologies, and to levy taxes on subscriptions so, we can f so that you will be funding government-owned networks whether you like it or not. Now, this idea that we will allow the regulators to set a price that's just and reasonable has very frequently gone wrong. There is a better solution. We can allow the market to innovate. Dan's voice over IP technology collapsed the price of long distance, and thousands of substitutes for Ma Bell emerged. It's exactly the kind of innovation we want, but it's what scares regulators because it puts them out of business. Now, in the colonial era, it was common for the British to seize the crops of the colonists, to occupy their taverns without pay, and to indiscriminately tax their products and services. But the Fifth Amendment ensures that the government cannot confiscate your property without just compensation. ISPs networks are no different. They are complex, intelligent innovations requiring massive amounts of capital, labor, and patents. But if the government mandates how the traffic is to be treated and priced without compensating them, it amounts to a regulatory takings. That's why net neutrality violates the Fifth Amendment as well as the First. Now, let me make a quick point from administrative law, and I will wrap up. As a society, we can decide that we want to regulate the Internet, but we have to update our laws to do so. The last time we weighed in on this question was 1996. We had a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. And we made a law that said in no uncertain terms that the internet is to be free from and unfettered from federal and state regulation. It was an excellent policy. It unleashed an explosion of innovation. All of the internet companies we know today, as well as massive investment in networks, more than $1.5 trillion. Now, to put that in perspective, as Americans, we are for less than 5% of the world's population. We enjoy 25% of the world's investment in telecommunications networks. It's a staggering figure. And that investment has continued for some 20 years, until 2015. Now, this policy was in place until 2015, this light touch policy that had been tremendously successful. And in, the, in 2015, President Obama instructed the FCC to regulate the internet to contravene the will of the people, and in so doing, he made a terrible breach of the FCC's independence and the separation of powers. Now, thankfully, that policy has been reversed, but now we're in the midst of millions of dollars of litigation, a gravy train that supports 50 law firms around the country, thousands of lawyers are all fighting about the FCC. Now, the Electronic Frontier Foundation actually agreed with this assessment. In 2009, they wrote a blog about the Trojan horse of regulatory overreach, and I quote, 
Congress has never given the FCC any authority to regulate the Internet for the purpose of ensuring net neutrality. In place of explicit congressional authority, we expect the FCC will rely on its, quote, ancillary jurisdiction, a position that amounts to, we can regulate the Internet however we like without waiting for Congress. That's a power grab, end quote. Now, I earned my PhD studying net neutrality rules around the world. Some 50 countries have made such rules, but they have done so through the will of the people, not the fiat of government bureaucrats at the FCC. Now, there's something fishy when a cadre of advocates all of a sudden say, we need some obscure statute from 1934 to regulate the Internet. It's very simple. Net neutrality is about controlling speech and controlling property. The left does not want conservative media to proliferate, and neutrality is how to cap its growth. Secondly, neutrality is highly desired by the rich Silicon Valley Internet giants who pay zero for the networks that they use, but they expect us consumers to pay 100% whether or not we ever access their content. Moreover, they don't, uh, the Silicon Valley doesn't want prioritization because it allows guys like Dan to take on the internet giants and challenge their dominance. If we learned anything about Facebook's testimony this week on the Hill, it's that Silicon Valley wants neutrality for everybody else but not themselves. So in closing, I want to say there is a Benjamin Talmadge in each and every one of you, smart and brave and innovative, and it doesn't matter your age. It starts by thinking for yourself and pushing back against the orthodoxy. Internet freedom is about permissionless innovation for network technologies to compete and the sovereignty of consumers to decide which parameters should matter, not for the regulators to tell us. Well, all right. <laughs> uh, I will echo my thanks. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, uh, great to meet some of you and hope to meet all of you later on. Um, this is indeed a really important issue and not one easily reduced to slogans or uh, um, uh, feel-good descriptions. Um, but it is important for to, to the future of the Internet and thus to the future of our, uh, of our country, uh, both in terms of economics and in terms of the freedom of speech. Um, and I'm glad, Rosalind, that you, that you, that you mentioned the, uh, the First Amendment issues because, because uh, uh, freedom of speech is a central issue here. Um, so if you are, are live or, work or study on campus here, then your um, provider of high-speed Internet is most likely the university. Um, so. I'd like you to think about whether, how you would feel about the university uh, directing or shaping uh, what you see on the, when you use the internet, um, either by um, preventing you from going to particular sites or using particular applications, um, or more subtly by making some applications work faster, better, more efficiently, and it, steering your preferences towards certain things. That'd be problematic. Um, I don't know um, if uh, this is, uh, I may be dating myself here, but, but, but another comparison to think about is um, between the Internet as we think of it, we, you know, which is you know, having a connection to the world um, that you control and your preferences control what information you receive and who you communicate with. Compare that to, to cable TV, for one, which, which is uh, certainly a diverse platform. It's certainly a, uh, uh, there is a wealth of entertainment and information on, on, on cable TV, but who can speak on cable TV, right? Well, you need to be connected to a cable network or, or a broadcast TV station or uh, basically in some ways sort of, sort of have a link, be a link in that chain and have, be, be, have the um, blessing of the, uh, the various gatekeepers on cable TV. Maybe at best you'll, you know, you'll get onto the local public access station in a 3 a.m. time slot um, if you don't know people. Um, that comparison between cable TV and the Internet as we know it really, I think, captures um, the issue that, the, 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 that we call net neutrality. Um, and it really goes at the heart of why the Internet is revolutionary, um, because it can be used for all kinds of applications, because every user controls 
whom they communicate with, and what information they want to receive from anywhere on Earth, nearly. Um, and because it can carry all kinds of content with very few gatekeepers. Um, the reason why, the reason why it's revolutionary is a design principle which was agreed upon in the, in the earliest days of the Internet when it was a research project between a few universities and defense contractors in the 60s and 70s. Um, it's called the end-to-end -end principle. It's, this is the, the, the notion that the center of the network carries data indiscriminately and innovation in terms of new applications happens at the edge of the network, which means with users and with, with, with providers and with companies who are providing the, 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 the content, not the, the companies that are transporting data from one end to the other. There, there, is, the, there is certainly a great deal of innovation that happens you know, at, the, at, at the center of the network in terms of transmitting data, but the center doesn't get to control what passes over it and what priority is given to the, to the things that pass over it and who may use it. Um, that uh, fundamentally is why the internet has been so revolutionary and why it's different from cable TV. Now I don't know how, have you, how, many, uh, how many of you remember the old dial-up uh, information services like AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy. Um, they were great. Um, I was on those before I was on the internet. Um, before, I, before I knew about the web, uh, they, but they were walled gardens. You saw what this one, uh, uh, what one company decided you should see, and you could communicate with the member, you know, the customers of that company, and not others. Um, they provided access to the internet, some of, some of them, but it was it was not it was not the main function. Um, this consensus of the end-to-end -end principle is, has been maintained, I think, largely by, by custom, by, by inertia, and, 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 by, uh, and, by, and by, to some degree by competition, until the last 10 years. And in the last 10 years, that consensus has been threatened. It's been threatened um, partly by a lack of competition, by consolidation. Uh, about 35% of American homes don't have any choice of broadband internet provider. Um, the vast majority of American homes and small businesses uh, have at most two choices for wired broadband. There's a bit more competition if we're talking about wireless. Uh, you know, there's four major, four major wireless uh, uh, ISPs. Uh, uh, their, their speeds are not quite the same. Their reliability is not quite the same, well, you know, although, it's, although it's getting there. Um, So, um, as Rosalind said uh, uh, a bit about the, uh, a bit about EFF, I mean, um, uh, the organization that I work for, uh, it, it was founded back in 1990. Actually, it is actually older than the World Wide Web by a year. It um, was conceived of to defend the nascent public internet against uh, threats to individual rights, particularly talking about freedom of speech and about privacy. Um, and in those early days, most of those threats came from government. Um, Ill-conceived law enforcement raids on software companies, uh, ill-conceived laws like the original version of the Communications Decency Act, which, which was, was a broad, sweeping um, prohibition on constitutionally protected speech on the Internet. It flowed out of a moral panic about uh, the, basically the ability to watch pornography on the Internet. Uh, this was 1996. Um, thankfully, the court struck, struck the, the um, bad provisions of that law down as violations of the First Amendment, leaving the, 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 the good ones, which, which, which really are helpful to this day. Um, as time went on, we, uh, you know, and as the Internet matured, um, we began to see threats not only from government, but, but also from consolidations of economic power in industry. Um, both in ISPs, uh, broadband providers, the pipe from you to the internet, and in some of the major uh, edge providers um, that Roslyn referred to as Silicon Valley. So you, you know, you're, it's sometimes called GAFA, right? Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, sometimes Microsoft gets added in there, so GAMFA, I guess. 
Um, there are other big ones in other countries. Those are our, those are those are those are our, those are our behemoths. But um, um, those two, you know, those two camps, we're talking about a whole lot of consolidation, including with the uh, the ISPs and the edge providers. Um, so where are we now? Like, like I said, this consensus is threatened. Blocking websites is quite common in many countries for any number of reasons, some of them loosely connected to law enforcement, uh, some of them simply sort of through government pressure. Um, a lot of places uh, like China, for example, the Great Firewall of China is partly a government enterprise, but it's partly sort of a loose collaboration between the major internet service providers and the government. Um, you wink and a nod and, you know, the internet service providers on their own initiative are blocking things they think the government would disapprove of. Um, less so even, you know, but, 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 but in uh, um, uh, countries with more freedom of speech, um, the, uh, uh, there, are, there are loose policies and these same sorts of collaborations with government that tend to lead to uh, uh, private uh, censorship and private decisions made about content. Uh, um, And then you also, because I, I, I mentioned, I, I, I mentioned consolidation. We also, we're, we're starting to see vertical consolidation. So the major ISPs are are buying major sources of creative content and and edge providers. So uh, Comcast owns NBC Universal, um, Verizon owns Yahoo and the former AOL, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, um, AT and T is is trying to buy Time Warner. Uh, that's the, the trial on that merger is ongoing. Um, and that creates an incentive for an internet service provider to favor content from, from, from its own subsidiaries over others. So, so that temptation is there. Um, and then more broadly, you see uh, uh, efforts um, by the ISPs to leverage their privileged position as the pipe between you and the internet. Um, it was famously a quote by the CEO of AT&T back in 2005, uh, where he essentially said, you know, I think we should start um, charging edge providers money to reach our customers. In other words, to collect tolls both from our customers and from the people that they're communicating with, who aren't directly customers of, 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 of the ISP. Um, that was a wake-up call. Uh, and that was a wake-up call for the FCC. That was a wake-up call for a lot of folks because you're concerned about the, their ability to, to, to be in control of their own internet experience. Um, and beginning in 2005, roughly, to that between 2005 and 2007, the FCC created policies um, to address this. And that is roughly what we think of today as net neutrality rules. Um, those have existed in some form since 2005 under both Democratic and Republican administrations. Um, and they've been enforced by, dem by, by, by both administrations, uh, particularly in 2007 when uh, the, uh, the FCC uh, under President George W. Bush uh, um, it, uh, made an effort to enforce its policies against, uh, it was Comcast, for interrupting certain kinds of internet transmissions, transmissions using the BitTorrent protocol. Um, and, and some other protocols, including some um, video conferencing protocols. They were doing this surreptitiously, um, and they were making distinctions among the different sorts of applications that people were using on the internet. Um, that was a violation of the FCC's principles, and they enforced against it. Now, the court said they didn't have the authority for it. This is right around this, now this brings us to right around the time of the quote that Rosalind mentioned, where uh, EFF said, and, 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 we, and we continue to say that it's important that agencies like the FCC have bounds on their authority. And the argument that they were using at the time about ancillary authority didn't work and still doesn't. It, it was they, because it was an argument that basically get, put no limits on their power. Federal agencies can only do what Congress authorizes them to do. And that's an important principle of democratic control because it's the Congress that is accountable to the voters. Um, whereas the agencies are, are, are delegated powers by Congress. The, 
That began a dialogue with the courts. The courts said, you can't use ancillary authority. They tried again under a different set of rules in 2010. Same substance of rules. And as we talk about this, I think it's important to distinguish between what rules should we have and how should we enforce them and whether we have the right framework in place to enforce them. Because that's important. We can have great rules. But if we're doing them under a legal framework that, that would let the FCC or another agency um, or private citizens um, do, you know, do, uh, um, you know, exceed what they should be able to do, leave out private citizens. I'm really talking about government here. Um, that's a problem. We, we, how, how we do things is almost as important as, as, as what we do when we're talking about regulation. <coughs> um, so that was, there was a dialogue with the courts. And, the, and the, the second, in the second round, the courts said, OK, you do have authority under the words of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 to pass net neutrality rules. Uh, this was called this was under what was called Title I of the, of the, of the Communications Act. Uh, which was the, the light touch, the, the, the sort of the, the, more, the more general um, form of internet regulation, excuse me, excuse me, so the category of regulation, not, t not Title II, which is, as Rosalind mentioned, was, was originally written for telephone service. Um, but um, there was this prohibition in Title I that says anything regulated under Title I cannot be subject to common carrier regulation. So what's common carrier? This goes, three, this goes at least 300 years back, uh, probably more. Common carriers are facilities. They're not, they're not government agencies. Um, they're not even quasi-government agencies, but, but they are the sorts of businesses that, have to, that, that, are, that we as a society sort of think of as, 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 one, as, as businesses that should treat everyone equally. Originally, this was ferries, toll bridges, um, I think sometimes hotels, um, this, and this is going back to England in the colonies. Uh, later so on, of course, got, we've yeah. got a two-minute warning just to ensure equitable time between the Absolutely. two. Absolutely. Um, uh, where was I? The, um, it, you know, obviously this moved on to things like railroads, then 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 telephone service. Um, the court said that if you're uh, if you're going to do a rule, uh, no blocking, no throttling, and no paid prioritization. Um, that's common carrier rule, and you can't do that under Title I. So finally in 2015, and this was the development, Rosalind mentioned, the, the, the FCC said, okay, we're going to classify broadband internet service as Title II, like a telephone company, but we're not going to enforce all of the other provisions in Title II that, that dealt with, um, with telephone companies. There was no rate regulation. There was no tax. Um, there was these, these four rules. No blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, and the general conduct rule. We were not crazy about that one because it's back to the open-ended mandate, the same sort of thing the court had struck down the first time. Nonetheless, the court upheld this. They said, you've got this right. You've got the rules have stayed the same throughout, but the legal authority for it is now sound. Enter 2017. Um, the new chairman of the FCC, all of those rules repealed and, and, and back to Title I. So the fight is not, the fight obviously continues, which is why we're still here talking about it. Um, Congress has taken it up either to restore the previous rules or maybe to come up with a new set. Um, now I agree with Rosin, we were talking earlier that, that it, should be, it should be resolved in Congress. Our current law is 20 years old. It needs updating. Um, I think that rule should look something like what the FCC had before 2017. Um, there are other fights. Um, the, re the repeal is being challenged in court, and the states themselves are um, working on passing new net neutrality rules. There were bills passed in Oregon and Washington. There's a strong bill under consideration in California, and there were executive orders in, uh, in a number of states, including, I believe, Montana and New York, um, that put us back towards a set of principles to prevent data discrimination. Um, that's where we are, and I'm looking forward to uh, sort of getting into, the, getting into the weeds a little bit on this. Thank you, both of you. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> so um, for my first question, um, it, I thought it was interesting you both referenced uh, freedom of speech in your description, or your advocacy, rather, why your takes on the issue um, were the correct one. Um, 
could you each uh, expand a little bit more um, why the other side, t in your thought, um, does not uphold freedom of speech? Um, because to my understanding, you know, yeah. So go ahead. Please, the, um, um, there is, I, I, it's important to make this distinction, right? There is the First Amendment and there is freedom of speech. And the First Amendment is a key guarantor of freedom of speech in this country, but it, it, it's not the sole issue. The First Amendment is a protection against restraints on speech by the government. It says Congress shall make no law, which is interpreted to mean the entire federal government and the states. Um, there, is, there is a broader issue, which is if you are essentially connected to the world by one company, and that company is shaping what you see and who you communicate with, that too is an impact on speech. Um, and again, I urge you to consider what would happen if, uh, you know, if the university were doing this on campus. Now, we could say, sure, that uh, if, if, if the university was steering your preferences to, to, to particular research materials or particular websites and sources of commentary, you'd probably just look them up on your phone or go over to a cafe and use that. But that's an extra step, right? It'd be a few minutes walk. You'd do it, especially if you were passionate about it. But it would change your preferences a little bit. It would change what you did. It would change what you cited in your, in your, in your, in your academic work, um, probably towards things that didn't require that walk across campus. Um, and that is an impact on speech, and really a pretty significant one. There was a study that said that um, uh, a, just a little bit of delay in loading of websites and the running of interactive websites makes a big difference in what people spend time on. Um, so changing those things a little bit, deprioritizing some websites and making some others run, uh, uh, run faster, really does change what people see and, and thus what they think about and what they communicate. Um, that's, that's the First Amendment issue. Really, really quick about the Berninger uh, case that, 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 that Rosalind mentioned. Um, this case was, was brought in the um, Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit as a challenge to the FCC's previous rule, the 2015 rule. And the D.C. Circuit soundly rejected the First Amendment argument twice. And I actually think their interpretation of this was pretty Rosalind's good. shaking her head. Do you want to expand <laughs> yeah. on that? Um, so would we want to take the, the, free, the free speech angle? Yeah. So in any case, the, uh, the D.C. Circuit said very little about First Amendment discussion because the, D the circuit courts don't want to get involved in key constitutional questions. So they kick, it's been kicked up to the Supreme Court. The interesting thing is if this case is decided on a, uh, in favor of Dan Berninger, the FCC is essentially out of business because it goes back to this principal understanding around um, can the government regulate speech. Now, this is a, an, you know, we can have a whole debate about um, the various communication laws we have in America's history around how certain kinds of platforms uh, had uh, different regulations, Communications Decency Act, and, and, a, and a variety of things. But suffice it to say here is that if the ISPs were actually a problem, then why do we have all the internet companies that we have today? If in fact they were so horrible, why didn't they kill Skype in the cradle? Why didn't they end all the platforms when they had a chance to? I mean, the fact of the matter is the FCC in its own, um, in its own rules, it can only cite four minor instances of when this was a problem. And all of those issues were dealt with without net neutrality rules. So they're tr you don't need this heavy-handed approach to take care of what can be done through uh, uh, a normal FCC action or, or what's, what goes on at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, what, but what I think the bigger issue here is around innovation. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a user online, what is important for you is to have multiple ways to communicate. You want multiple networks which are not connected with each other. And net neutrality is not about competition whatsoever. That's not the goal. The end game of net neutrality is to have one government-owned network. I, and it could be a, a connection of municipally-owned networks, but all regulated by the FCC. The model is Ma Bell moved to the internet. They want to have one fiber network for everyone. Now, many people said that would be great. You know, they'd like to have that. That sounds fine. But that undermines the concept of competition. And for those people who are concerned about government surveillance, 
you should be really concerned that there's just one network run by the government. That is actually the reason that the military wanted the internet in the first place. They didn't want to be stuck on the Ma Bell for their military communications. They were concerned and they said, can we please make an alternative? So today, when we talk about uh, you know, which networks do we go online, it's really important that we have something like 5G. You know, 5G is like the end of cable. Okay? 5G is you know, the ability to deliver speeds 10 times as fast as 4G, like fiber to your phone. Okay, you can be able to get, watch your movie downloaded to your TV in one second. So what we should care about is that we have new technologies and multiple ways to communicate with each other. So we don't ever care. If one goes down, we have multiple ways to get there. And there's no one network that does it all. Each of these technologies has a different characteristic, a different material, a different use case, a different budget, and so on. Uh, and so that's the sort of diversity. We want network diversity. We don't want everything to be the same. We want it to be diverse. We want to have multiple uh, opportunities. And so that would be, if essentially what you're talking about with speech, if you would look, if you'd bring that concept to networks, you've got multiple network speaking. And that would actually be a wonderful, wonderful outcome of a, in, in, a, in a diverse world. Well, I do you just challenge you on a point there. Net neutrality as, 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 as we conceive of it. Again, and again, I don't like the term. And in fact, Tim, Professor Tim Wu, who coined the term back in 2005, regrets it. It's, it's boring. It makes eyes glaze over, and it, and it elides a lot of the complexity, but, but uh, although maybe not quite so much as internet freedom. <laughs> but uh, that said, we're a bit stuck with it when even Burger King commercials are using it. Um, as I said, sometimes we use the term data discrimination because, because at least that gets more to the heart of the, uh, the problem. But if you conceive of it, again, separating the rules from how we get to the rules, but, but no blocking, no throttling, of particular content, application services, or devices, and no paid prioritization of particular content, applications, or services. I think it's a pretty big lift to go from those rules to one government-run monopoly over the internet. Because, again, the fact is we had those, that, that is the policy that we had for 12 years starting in 2005. It, was, it wasn't perfect. The, the, the authority for it was flawed at first, but the rules were there. The FCC enforcement of those rules was there. And that, frankly, is why we didn't see more data discrimination. The, the, now, the examples we did see were, 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 were pretty bad. They were, they were testing the waters. The ISPs, as they consolidated market power, were testing the waters. And they were, for example, blocking voice over IP, for which the, for which the FCC uh, 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 fined them. And they were blocking particular protocols like BitTorrent, which, which, which are used for many different applications. And uh, uh, making those sorts of distinctions, there was, um, there wasn't, this is outside just the US. Just to clarify, there, yeah. you've said the, the rules were implemented since 2005. Mm -hmm. Um, what changed under President Obama? Just for no, so that was, a, to, we should qu quickly go over. 2005 was a policy statement mm -hmm. that were, actually they were called the uh, f uh, uh, Four Freedoms. Mm -hmm. Now that was, uh, and, and they were very different than the, so Four Freedoms, it was a policy statement about users could connect to the content of their choice with the device of their choice and they're entitled to meaningful transparency. Mm -hmm. Great. It doesn't, uh, those actually seem great. And, and uh, but as, things went on, the FCC got more and more prescriptive. But what the court said is that um, you can't uh, apply common carrier rules to a service that's not a common carrier. This is very strict within our Communications Act. And this is the bridge that, um, that we the people have not wanted to cross because we believe that the internet is not the telephone network. The FCC made that statement. They said the internet is a mere extension of it so we just can slap on what we thought was a rotary phone, we just call that the internet. It, it's not the case. So I want to tell you why, um, you know, and again, this was the words from EFF, the Trojan horse, right? It's a beautiful gift, but then you, you get these bright line rules, all of a sudden you've regulated away your, your wonderful internet. We have several bills have been presented over the last four years to codify these very, provi these very provisions, but the 
net neutrality advocates have always rejected it because they said, we won't do any uh, compromise until we get Title II. That is very fishy. Why do they want Title II? Title II has 300 provisions in it that allow, that, that give the FCC enormous power. And that is the bridge that the Republicans have not wanted to cross. And that when you say to most people, they say, look, we don't want FCC to regulate the Internet. We want competition. So I'm going to even tell you very quickly why even blocking throttling and paid prioritization in themselves are problematic. There are good reasons to block content on the network, notably for security reasons, for malware reasons. You know, let's, I have two children. I may be concerned about, um, you know, content my children see. Why can't I have the right to buy a connection that blocks uh, pornography that uh, I don't want my children to see? Why should I have to support the films of Harvey Weinstein? I don't want my internet connection to provision that kind of stuff, okay? Why should I have to pay for it? That's why blocking is a good thing. It protects my right as a consumer not to pay for content that I don't want in my network and a lot of garbage of, of malware. So that's a very good reason why you have intelligence in the core of the network. The second thing is throttling. Throttling is extremely valuable network service. T-Mobile's very popular free music service is, uses throttling because when you screech down a movie to your phone, you can have it in a nice quality by slowing the speed. Okay? And that is what's called throttling. It enables consumers to enjoy free video in a nice quality. But gee, all of a sudden it, it violates the FCC principles. It doesn't make any sense, okay? So engineers, they're not that stupid. They're not going to say, oh, you, you know, there's a reason why I might have that network practice to enable something my customers may want. And finally, this issue of prioritization. If I, as a consumer, want to have a certain kind of a, 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 a telemedicine service or something, why can't I buy that? If a person wants to offer an eye examination over the Internet, a doctor, for example, why can't he offer that? Uh, so, so that is what paid prioritization, if you ban it, you eliminate things that are extremely valuable, as well as our freedom of choice to, conf to decide within a marketplace, do we want to have that, that sort of thing. Now, they will thro uh, throw out and say, oh, we're so afraid because the, the big companies will be shake, you know, uh, Comcast is going to shake down the little guy. You know, I used to work in <laughs> internet company myself. We want to price our products so that companies will buy them. Okay? There's no business model in pricing something so high that nobody buys it. We have no cases of any startup ever cannot get online because of the ISP. There is zero in this country. And I, I defy you to give me an example that a startup couldn't get online. But we do have the FCC shutting down startups. So um, in, in, in any case here, that what might sound like it's reasonable on the surface, you've got to challenge yourself to really think it through. My rule in Washington is anything that sounds good is bad. <laughs> and thinks that any policy that sounds great, you, you really have to question it. But on the other side, something that sounds like, gee, that's a, that doesn't sound pretty good. Challenge yourself to think it through. Okay. The other part here is what is not described in the media is the, um, you know, is the huge market. There's a huge money on this. That why is it that Netflix um, doesn't want prioritization? Well, they don't want competitors. Netflix has all the money in the world to put a library of their content close to every user. They are prioritizing their content. Okay? Facebook builds an undersea cable to Europe. They have their own networks where they prioritize Facebook-only content. Right? But somehow it's okay for Facebook to do it and not the ISP. You know, they have more pipes than the ISPs. So, so is, is, to clarify, is prioritization simply uh, internet or web-related companies building networks that promote their content, content over other content? No, prioritization is a, it's a quality of service within the network to ensure that, a, um, that the data gets a particular kind of, of a service that it needs. So if you are going to do, uh, if you need to control for a latency or packet loss, if you're going to conduct some telemedicine, you want to guarantee that the connection has the service that you need in order for it to work. Now, in your home, maybe you have a smart home. You might say, well, look, uh, I want my uh, refrigerator. I don't care if the signal doesn't get to the internet. I'll pay, please give me it for a discount, less than best efforts. I'd like my internet to be best efforts, but by God, dolly, I want my heart monitor to have more than best efforts. Mm -hmm. So I might have a different kind of price for every sort of service that's there. I don't want one price for everything because I'm going to overpay. That's bad for me as a consumer. And as we move to the Internet of Things, by the way, the, the, most of the users are machines. 
They're not worried about discrimination, right? We're moving to the world where we're trying to put rules predicated on people, and now we have million, billions of machines using the internet. When you think about the kinds of contracts that will need to be made, you want to prepay your data, you want to bundle your data. The, the, the Tesla prepays the data for you, for example, when you're driving so you can have you know, a set of services there. All of this is going to need extremely sophisticated, non-neutral kinds of pricing in order to work. We can't manage one price for the whole thing because it's not efficient. And as consumers, we, we want to be able to have the application get the quality of service it needs. And this is not going to be, if we rely on the FCC's bright line rules, we'll never get these wonderful smart homes and intelligent networks and internet of things that we're dreaming about today. So uh, who here has seen or used an ISP that offered to block the films of Harvey Weinstein? There's a reason. <laughs> there is th th this, this notion of blocking being desirable because individuals want to filter what they see is, uh, is an economic nullity. Of course people want to filter what they see. But there is no business model for an ISP that does that. I take that back. I have, I have heard of it in one place. It was in, it's, in a, um, it's a single ISP that serves a, a very dense community of uh, um, uh, JNet. Yes. It's a, there's a yes. Jewish ISP yes, that filters yes, content. Yes. Right. I, but that, my understanding is the, 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 they're in, in Israel they filter content at the source. Um, their um, service in New York, I believe they just send you software that filters on your own devices. But the point is nobody can make money doing that because in the U.S. our preferences are different and our preferences are different from our neighbors. And if there's things we don't want to see, we can absolutely control that on our own devices. But there is no business model for having the ISP do it for everyone. Um, that just doesn't work. It doesn't exist. A um, couple of things. A couple of things in response here. So, so um, this um, very quickly. There's this notion of telemedicine, remote eye exams, things that are latency sensitive, things where you really need a good quality of service. It's important to note, because I think Rosalind is exaggerating this a bit, net neutrality rules, the rules that we're talking about, never apply to every use of the Internet. In their final form, the 2015 rules, they applied to mass market um, broadband Internet service, not specialized services. So they don't apply to the Tesla. They don't apply to a telemedicine service that you specifically subscribe to that, 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 that includes the connectivity. And they don't apply to large businesses that, are, that have the sophistication to negotiate for particular contracts for how they want data delivered. Those have always existed. You've always been able to rent a, a dedicated line from the phone company to connect to large corporate campuses. That's the sort of specialized service here that we're talking about. Um, it's just it's simply it's simply not true that, that that any reasonable set of net neutrality rules would impact those things. We can have quality of service you without her, discrimination. Yeah. How do you address Rosalind's objections about the uh, heart monitor and the fridge? Do those apply or not apply? Uh, those can be delivered to your house over uh, over the same physical infrastructure, but that's not internet service. That's reliable low latency heart monitor service. In a sense you could call it, it's, 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 in a sense Even it's simply it's about labeling. Even it's connected to the internet? That's right. Um, the, if you think about the cable that comes into your house that mm -hmm. carries often both ch you know a couple hundred channels of television and, and the internet, behind the scenes they're using a lot of the same technology but they're marketed to the consumer as two different services. But it, it's an artificial regulatory distinction. There's no reason we can't have telemedicine over the public internet. And why would you un put some unfair restraint on trade? There may be companies who want to do that. And why should you say, well, you're doing this service, therefore you have to use a private network? You know, that, that's, that's anti-competitive. Well, I think what, it's because why, that's not what, because I mean, it it's, it's on artificially what decided, the FCC gives you no good reason why you, you have to make that distinction. There is no, there's no scientific description of a specialized service. Like a lot of these rules, they're not based in science. They're based in, they're based in a legal interpretation of what lawyers think is science, but it's not what scientists think is science. I would say they're based in the public conception of what the internet is and what internet service means. 
because so many things are used on the internet, but we don't think of them as broadband internet service. It's a device that happens to send some data over the internet. That could be that, that could be a heart monitor. That could be that could be a, an autonomous car. That could be medical equipment. Internet service. And the FCC actually did come up with a pretty good description of this. There's an even better one in the, Cal in the bill that's being considered in California right now. And, but it's a mass market service that reaches all or nearly all endpoints on the internet. It's what we think of as internet service. And you can almost think of this as a, uh, a, 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 a regulation about advertising. If Comcast is selling you Xfinity internet, what does that mean? Is it the internet, or is it something more like cable TV or the old AOL? If they're calling it internet, that ought to mean something. You know, and if, they, and if there really were market demand for a walled garden service, for example, just Facebook, <coughs> or just the uh, AT&T properties that, that used to be called AOL and Yahoo, uh, we could have that. They just, to me, in my mind, we couldn't call that the internet. And all of the states and localities that granted franchises to those companies to run fiber and, uh, um, and, and copper and so on uh, would, you know, f to provide what we all think of as the internet, they'd probably reconsider. They said, actually, we're, you know, actually no, we're, this is not the internet. This is AOL. Rosalyn, care to respond? Yeah. So I did my PhD looking at net neutrality rules in 50 countries, and I looked five years before and five years after rules were done. And I was specifically interested in rule, countries that adopted hard regulation, because what the policymaker said, if we adopt this rule, we should have more innovation in our country after we adopt the rule. And to me, I said, that's great. I work with developing countries. If all you got to do is make net neutrality and you have all this innovation, that will be wonderful. We'll help, we'll lift the poor out of poverty and, and so forth. Now. Um, what did I find? Well, most of the countries that adopted net hard net neutrality were in Latin America, and you had Slovenia, Netherlands. None of them created new apps after they adopted the rules. However, the countries that adopted soft rules, multi-stakeholder model, codes of conduct, um, uh, uh, soft rules, they actually produce more innovation. It's very telling that Japan and South Korea use soft rules. China has no rules. We download more apps today from China than we do from the United States. They have no net neutrality rules. They're extremely innovative. Now, I'm not advocating a Chinese approach, but the data doesn't support the, the, the rules that the FCC took in 2015. So uh, the, the, the point there is, the other thing you can do is you can look empirically. Uh, since 20, the period we had two years when FCC's rules were in place. What's interesting is there's really no new services on the internet. We essentially have uh, knockoffs of advertising apps. Now, where is the innovation going on? It's going on private networks, fintech, it's going on in blockchain. Everybody has exited to the non-regulated parts of the internet. And that's telling. That's where the investors go. It's where the entrepreneurs go. Dan Berninger, he will move to blockchain. So if our idea was somehow we were going to get more innovation on the public internet, which is regulated by these magic rules, it's not happening. I, I really uh, hope you all aren't being confused by a bit of jargon here, but blockchain applications run on the internet and through your ISP. <laughs> FinTech runs on the internet and through ISPs. They are not unregulated any more than ISP, uh, to, 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 to any degree uh, uh, beyond ISPs. There are basic fintech apps. I'm talking about fundamental new innovation that is done in financial firms where they have multiple networks to their location provisioned with a, exactly the kind of service that they wanted, the prioritization that they want. They have it tailored to their needs. Now, the, the kind of particular fi fintech apps that some people will download, they may access them through the public internet, but the technology behind it isn't, isn't different. What I'm talking about is something fundamentally different, and that is not going on in the public internet today. They can't get the quality of service they need. They can't, they can't make a contract for the particular speeds they need because net neutrality is best efforts. It means you all treated the same. You can't guarantee at particular speed that, that, that you want for your app to work. I guess I don't understand why that's a harm. That is, that is exactly what I was describing, which is a specialized service. It's not mass market broadband internet service. It's something else. Those have always existed. 
Businesses have always used leased well, facilities my, my, and technology my, my from, critique, from network companies. No, my critique is simply I want the policy to, to achieve the policy goal. If the policy is telling me I'm supposed to get more innovation on my public internet after these rules are in place, I want to see that it appears. And the interesting thing, if you'll note, we haven't had any new Googles or Facebooks. Isn't that interesting? In the countries that have the hardest rules, the market share of the internet companies are the highest. You have the least competition amongst the platforms. Isn't that something? Do you think maybe they use the net neutrality rules to cement their dominance? But Rosalind, have you have you posited a reason for a causation there, or is that a well? I can I can tell you one reason. Wouldn't you guys like to have zero price broadband? Would you like to pay zero and get a broadband subscription? That would be a pretty cool thing, that you would ha wouldn't have to pay $100 or $150. Well, you know, ISPs have wanted to offer that, but that has been systematically deterred by the Silicon Valley companies because that's disruptive to their advertising business. If, in fact, all of a sudden you could save money because a third party was sponsoring your broadband s service, that would be very valuable as a consumer, but would not be so happy to the Google and Facebooks of the world because all of a sudden that advertisers might have another place to put their, their, um, their advertising. Right, so, so we'd like to have time for some audience questions. Okay. Um, we'll have mics going around. I, I have a question. Suppose I have three companies. I have Comcast, which is an internet provider. It owns the wires. It owns the pipes that carries the content. We have Netflix, and my name is Fred Polner, and we have the Fred Polner Company. I'm just a startup, all right? Now, Comcast owns the pipes, but it also owns a um, movie rental company. You can rent movies and watch movies on the internet um, provided by Comcast, or if you're in a non-Comcast area, by the Cox or somebody else, right? In fact, you can. <laughs> and we have Netflix, right? And Fred Polner wants to start up a, com a competitor to both Comcast and to Netflix. All right, that's now let's assume the government is content neutral. They don't care what programming I really want to provide to my customers. So I'd like to ask the person from AEI and the person from EFF, okay, tell me in that situation how network neutrality rules would fare and apply to each one of those three companies. So I'm going to tell you, this, this particular situation has been modeled to death. We have tons of academic papers to describe. It is called two-sided markets. And the idea of two-sided markets is that there's a platform in the middle. You have a set of, of cons customers on the one hand and vendors on the other. So a credit card company. They have a vendors, and they also have consumers, right? Insurance. There's a lot of two-sided markets. ISP is in the middle with content providers here and con customers over here. For the ISP, it's profit maximizing to get as many customers and as many content providers as possible. Okay? If in fact, if, so for example, Comcast is a great example. They have Netflix, they promote it. They also promote their own service. They do both because they want to maximize the choice to their consumers and give more value to their customers. If in fact they block Fred's polls service, you, and, and they're reducing the value of their service to their other users. You might think about it when you go into the supermarket. You will have a variety of products, but let's say it's, um, I don't know, what, what do you have here? Safeway, what's the supermarket here? The, which one? Stop and, Stop and what's the bigger one? What's a, you have a, Whole Foods. Okay, Whole Foods is a good example. Whole Foods may have a Whole Foods brand, and Whole Foods also sells its competitors. Okay, so it offers a variety because it can appeal to a larger base of customers. And if in fact they say, well, we refuse to sell Fred's thing, then the customers are like, well, gee, I want to be able to buy, I, I want to have more choice. So you're providing an economic yes. Not a no. So, you're saying not needed. no, because, <coughs> right, right. So now, here, so economics, the economics of this says, get maximized customers and content providers. Now, what happens if they do it? This is also very real. Well, you have the Federal Trade Commission. You have antitrust laws. You have every single thing of net neutrality has been described by the antitrust authorities for more than 100 years. Blocking, uh, refusal to trade, refusal to deal, bundling and tying. Every single problem of net neutrality can be dealt with through antitrust. 
and you don't need to have an FCC lording over your internet telling you how it should work and what the price should be. The antitrust authorities are there. The FC, FTC is very capable. They also work with the 50 state attorney general and the consumer protection authorities. They also work with the Department of Justice. So under a competition model, we have lots of enforcement at the federal and state level. And the more importantly, we remove the regulatory distortions, the arbitrage that lets some industries compete more easily because they're regulated in a different way. Correct. Right. And market forces. Yeah. So it's curious to me if a profit maximizing firm would allow all comers, then that it doesn't make sense why the ISP Madison River would have blocked uh, VOIP services or why Comcast would have secretly blocked BitTorrent transmissions or even why the Canadian ISP. Uh, back in about 2005, uh, uh, blocked the website of its employees' union when they went on strike. None of those are necessarily profit-maximizing behaviors, but they happened. That's what I'm concerned about. The antitrust authorities are important, but they're inadequate for these things for a couple of reasons. First, the Supreme Court in the mid-aughts issued a pair of decisions that essentially eliminated antitrust coverage of regulated industries, including telecommunications. In fact, that was the, in fact, that was the original one. And, and a, uh, a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission in 2010 said if, t if those rulings had been in place earlier, all of these actual instances of data discrimination that we've seen and that the FCC enforced against couldn't have happened. Out on an antitrust basis, it wouldn't it wouldn't have stopped them. It would it, it wouldn't stop them today. It's an important component. The other reason for that is these sorts of, of behaviors happen even when ISPs don't have market power in the antitrust sense. And the reason for that is something called the terminating access monopoly. When you're sitting at home, when you're sitting in your dorm room, even when you're sitting in the cafe across the street here, you've got one internet service provider. And when you need to look up a citation. For a, for a school assignment, that's the internet service provider that you're using, and that gives them a degree of power. Now, not as now it's 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 um, it's a particular degree of power. Terminating access monopoly is the reason we regulate taxis, is because once you're in the taxi cab with your luggage in the trunk and they're driving you around town, sure you could have used a different cab company, but it's pretty hard to do it now. That you're that's and that's actually been shown to exist in the. Um, ISP space. Professor uh, Barbara Vanchevic, who, who, who uh, I know Rosalind is familiar with, uh, looked at um, net neutrality issues in Europe and, and found that even though they have more competition, they still have a lot of these problems. So that's and a, an explanation for that is the terminating access monopoly. And that's another reason why, why, why antitrust alone doesn't get us there. So getting back to your question, the net neutrality rules would affect the ISP acting as an ISP. They wouldn't apply to the ISP acting as a movie rental service, but they would prevent the ISP from favoring their movie rental service over yours. Any further questions for the audience? All right, thank you both for your time. Um, this question is for both of you, and thank you, Dr. Rosalind. You've kind of opened my mind to net neutrality and the, the other side of it. My question would be in relation to virtual private networks, whereas people use them to sort of get around um, ISPs' invasions of privacy, not necessarily government invasion of privacy. But if you're suggesting throttling and prioritization of applications, doesn't that necessarily um, indicate that the ISP will have visibility into what you're using and what you aren't? So how do you sort of couch those two things that you want um, privacy and encryption, but you also want uh, prioritization of applications? I think that's a great question. The, um, I mean, increasing, almost, we're, we're very fastly encrypting all communications. So, um, you know, that's the way that it's going. And, and I mean, the interesting thing is, 
for most ISPs, they've chosen a business model largely of transmission. I mean, it is a correct point. It doesn't, it's not profit enhancing to be a curator, but that's not going to be that way for all time. There can be other instances on the margins, especially specialized ISPs might look at, look at those particular things. And the other part is that, you know, here's what I would say. Why is, it, why is it a consumer, why can't I get, why can't I customize my service? So I'm with you. I would, I think you should be able to say ISP, I want to have privacy, I want security, I want encryption, I want prioritization, and please do it for these things. And that's what I want. So I want to get the user to be in charge, not the FCC. Because what the FCC is saying, oh, speed is all that matters. Well, not really. <laughs> I care about security. And right now we're having... If we look at around the world, we have a lot of challenges with improving security because it's butting up against net neutrality rules, right? Because now you may have to, there are certain ports that are very dangerous. You know, ISPs have to make decisions around protecting the security of the network. Now, even though you try to make Russell, rules. do you have an actual example of a security situation? Yes, I do from Romania, if you want to go into it. We can look at the 29 countries of the European Union. Three of them are having issues around security because they are, they are butting up against the European net neutrality rules because they want to provide security in their networks. And they get complaints that they have, they're blocking particular ports that are putting malware, endangering other users, and then you have uh, organizations who will say, no, no, you can't block anything at all. Well, you know, how do I get... So going back to what we've talked about, the Internet had, you know... Per... Listen, the Internet needs to evolve, right? It was conceived at a time there were very few users. It was a trust environment, right? Very few applications. Today we have a lot of users and a lot of applications. We need more security. The architecture has to evolve. We can't rely on the same architecture forever. And by God, I hope we don't... Something will supplant the Internet at some time. I mean, it's not the end of innovation. People said that about the telegraph, right? This was, gonna, this was the end-all, be-all. Oh, my goodness. We can get, you know, the... Pre President Lincoln sent T-mails. That was a big deal, right? Thank goodness we, that we have evolved, okay? So, you know, this is, we want a dynamic system that's going to get better all the time. And I think the taxi example was most telling because please tell me the taxi regulator who was going to give you the app to rate your shitty driver, excuse my language, okay? That was never going to happen because the regulator wants to control the number of drivers and wants to keep the price of entry very high, was not interested in creating competition, what did Uber do? Uber, we found out, users have a lot of things they want to maximize. They want to have a baby seat in the car. They want to prearrange a trip. They want to make multiple stops. They like a car with different colors. They like to have a different quality of driver. No regulator was ever going to figure that out for the taxi. But the intelligence of the app, this transparency created by the, rating the user, rating the driver. And by the way, we didn't get Uber till we had mobile networks and mobile phones. Okay? That was something, it's what's called a, um, you know, an, an, an innovation that depended on other things having to, to come in place. Right? So what a wonderful thing that that's created. I'm sorry, no regulator ever did that. That was the marketplace. That was our fabulous policy from 1996 that said, hey, unfettered innovation, get going. Network people, you know, app people, figure it out. And by the way, we had mobile technologies in the 70s. The FCC didn't let us have them until the 90s. We could have had spectrum auctions in the 50s. FCC didn't let us have them for till 40 years because they said, oh, we're afraid. Okay? So the FCC is holding back the technologies of freedom that we all want. Um, so who, who here uses Uber or Lyft? Uh, who here has had a driver who didn't know how to navigate the city you were in? So that's okay, right? It happens. It's a choice. Certainly if you get in a taxi, you will have a driver who, who uh, 99 times, times out of 100 knows the city like the back of their hand, right? And Uber is not allowed to call themselves a taxi. In fact, their original name was Uber Cab, and they dropped cab off of it because they weren't regulated taxis. I like that there's both. In fact, I've used both this week. And I think it's good that Uber shouldn't be able to call itself a taxi. That it's more of a specialized service. That's really, what, that's really the distinction that we're talking about here. Getting back to your point, yes, um, absolutely various methods of prioritization and throttling do require deep packet inspection. That's harder. In encryption has made that harder, and Rosalind's right that the, the web is largely becoming in encrypted, and that keeps the ISP from seeing the, the data that you're transmitting or being transmitted to you. It, although it doesn't obscure the metadata, they can see who you're communicating with and when, which reveals a whole lot about you. 
It can see the websites that you're communicating with. Or if you're using a, a, v, a VPN, it can see that. Um, having to build the infrastructure to analyze those things and make prioritization decisions based on those is absolutely a violation of your privacy. All right, so one final question. Uh, we'll get the mic to you. Hi, um, thank you guys again so much for coming. Uh, this discussion has been really, really uh, enlightening and it's added a whole a lot of nuance to a, a conversation that has been very charged, uh, at least in the, the spheres that I've engaged it with. So I thank you both. Um, my question has is, is a little more, I think, general. Uh, has to do with like, maybe the point of why this is such a hot topic discussion, why, like why people care so much about this. Um, so if, you, if the both of you could answer, do you guys think that the internet is a utility? Uh, and do you think that as a res like do you think that right now in this world where we have, uh, I mean, would you guys consider that it's necessary to be, a, to be connected to the internet to truly be a active and productive member of democracy of society like what you know what parts of 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 human interaction human society uh the government um how much is that now underpinned by our information networks uh and how does how would your answer to that question i guess uh be incorporated into your arguments for and against net neutrality using the internet is absolutely a requirement in modern life uh, i saw a documentary a couple of years ago about net neutrality and Honestly, I didn't agree with most of the points in it, but it, it had this very dramatic image, which was from um, a uh, sort of a remote part of um, Western North Carolina uh, uh, in the mountains, um, where uh, there was very little competition and, in fact, very little high broadband internet service available at all for for a, a variety of rent-seeking reasons. Basically, the big ISPs didn't want to provide service in these remote regions and didn't, and didn't want anyone else providing it either, so they had the legislature ban it. But the, um, this, there was this image of parents parking their minivans on the shoulder of a busy freeway at the summit of a hill, which was the only spot in the county that got a 3G signal, so that their children could do their homework. If that's the length that people will go for a less than broadband internet connection, then yes, it is absolutely a necessity of modern life. It's certainly how we interact with government and with job search and with our peers and almost everything else. And, and um, what was the first part of your question again? <laughs> you think the internet is, is, is a utility? Yeah. And metaphors, are metaphors are dangerous. A lot of internet policy is, bu is built on metaphor. A lot of internet law is built on metaphor. Is it a dump truck? Is it a series of tubes? <laughs> uh, all metaphors are dangerous. They all limit our thinking to some degree. They're also necessary because we need to think of new and hard to visualize things in terms of things that we know. Given all that disclaimer, yes, I think the internet is a utility. <laughs> it's because it's a necessity, because, it, because, it, it's, it, because, it, because it's something we all need, and because we have all come to understand the internet as, and internet access as having a particular meaning, as meaning that we are in charge of what information we see and receive and, whom we, and with whom we communicate, not the government and not the monopolist ISP. So thank you for the question. I think it's, I want to um, echo one thing that Mitch said, is important we don't have binary thinking. And <clears throat> this concept is the internet is utility. I like to answer that and say, you know, I don't like to have technology religion. Um, I have an interesting view on this because I live in Copenhagen most of the year. And there, there is, um, there is a lot of uh, different kind of energy. Uh, uh, we have wind power, a number of energy sources. And the utilities actually have all kinds of sophisticated pricing, which would be illegal under net neutrality. Every single prioritization, fixed, all, the, all of those kind of things, if you applied them to our internet discussion, would be illegal to do. But it's enabled a small country like Denmark, which actually exports its wind power. So the interesting thing is I simply look at economics and and, ne and these notions as a tool to do different things. Uh, I think your question is going to something deeper. It's all about uh, as, us as human beings. And I think that we have to cultivate a life 
that is not on the internet. We have to cultivate our community. I mean, here we are in this room together. It's so wonderful to see real people and not be looking at, you know, a thousand Facebook friends. I mean, there's still, I think it's a very healthy thing to do not to say, well, I have to, the internet is the end all be all, it's a utility and has to have this kind of thing. Of course, it does very wonderful things and it enables, but this notion that, um, you know, this is the end of the world and we don't have it, if we don't regulate it this way today, you know, that's the stuff that I think we have to push back on. And I would also say I would encourage you to, um, to look around the world. There are different ways to solve problems. There are different, understand, there are different modes of, of doing things. And I just want to push back. Any time that you hear it has to be this way and not another way, the bell should go off of orthodoxy. <laughs> and you have to, again, remember what I said, things that sound good or bad. <laughs> Um, so, so challenge this notion that um, this utility, ha and if anything, when I look at some of the state of public utilities in the United States, state of California, the dams are breaking, uh, the California Public Utility Commission, there were deaths caused by downing power lines, I mean, it's a terrible state. So that scares me. I don't want that for my internet. <laughs> Please, can I, can I have somebody else do it? Can, you know? And the other part of it is it's also about cost. Because frequently, this kind of notion of utility is thrust upon you so that you're not allowed to ask, how much does it cost? And are there cheaper ways to do it? And are there alternatives? Because when you start bringing the alternatives to the picture, all of a sudden, the case of it has to be this way, it starts to fall apart. So I just want a world where we have policy options, where we're able to look at costs and benefits of different policy options and talk about the relative pros and cons. It shouldn't be Title II or nothing, nothing else is acceptable. There are a range of 100 different options here. Okay, So when you have a, a group calling for nothing else is acceptable in net neutrality, you know that that's wrong. So you're going to challenge yourself to think outside the box. The, um, this notion that, um, where was I going with this? Of course, things aren't going to stay the same. The reality of today is this is how we use the internet, and this is what we think, and this is what we think internet service means. And that reality was shaped by the engineering decisions made in the early days of the internet, and preserved first by consensus, and then by by rules. And that's what's given us all of the benefits, many of the benefits of the internet today. So sure, we, there's, there's other ways we could go. We could abandon the end-to-end -end principle and, and then internet service will evolve towards cable TV. Or like a walled garden service. And some people will love that, right? Some, there, there's some, 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 some people loved AOL. I did for a time. Till I sort of was a, became aware of a wider world. Well, that's the question at hand. The, the part of that's the, the question. That's, that's the question at hand. We, we don't need rules as it is keeps evolving. Evolve. We don't need to freeze it in time. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to our great speakers. <laughs>